geez, Joel, it, we've had a really crazy week at Uptime. We've been <laughs> skimming through all the news that's happening, and it's it's overwhelming all of a sudden. I don't know what happens once the, the summer ends and winter hits. It's like Wind Energy News Central the last uh, couple of weeks, actually. And, and this week, we're going to talk about a, a couple of different areas. Uh, we're talking about a Finnish company making wind turbine blades entirely out of laminated wood. So that's very similar to what they're talking about with towers. So we may have a wind turbine that's made entirely of wood. And then we have a really interesting discussion with Philip Totero of Intel Store regarding insurance companies and their preference for OEM maintenance contracts. So after that, we're going to talk about the success and, and kudos to Econor for uh, getting the world's largest floating wind farm started up, High Wind Tamp, and they're off the coast of Norway. Uh, and then we're going to jump gears, hop in a plane, go down to South Australia and talk with Rosemary about, <laughs> about her friends uh, in, in Australia and their grid issues with solar and wind shutdowns um, and, and kind of how that affects and what, what we think could happen in the future uh, in that market and in the U.S. market and other markets. Uh, and then lastly, eight more draft wind energy offshore areas in the central Atlantic. So we're talking about some that are in 400 meters plus of water, some shallower stuff. So there's a little bit of floating, a little bit of fixed bottom, um, but more offshore wind energy planning uh, and uh, areas coming to the U.S. I'm Alan Hall, president of WeatherGuard Lightning Tech, and I'm here with Australian renewables guru, Rosemary Barnes, and my good friend from Wind Power Lab, Joel Saxon. And this is the Uptime Wind Energy Podcast. All right, Rosemary, Finnish renewable product maker Stor Enzo, who is one of the largest private forest owners in the world, is partnering up with German startup Wooden Blade Technology. Now, it's spelled V-O-O-D-I-N. Uh, so if you happen to Google that, make sure you spell it correctly. And they are going to make sustainable wooden wind turbine blades. Now, you say to yourself, that seems a little bit crazy, right? Well, it's not actually crazy because they're doing it right now. The, uh, so the two companies are producing a 20-meter uh, blade section. And it's and they're planning to make an 80 meter blade, and that 20 meter blade be, is going to be put in service at the end of this year in Germany. So they're they're designing these blades much like we would design fiberglass wind turbine blades. It's laminated veneer lumber, so they can direct the fibers where they want them to go and provide strength. So they can make them lighter, um, not probably not as light as fiberglass, but probably pretty light. And the theory is because it's recyclable. Uh, my, my guess is that they can uh, just grind them up and turn them into mulch and then make new blades. So, Rosemary, first off, does, does this make sense? Is this, is this a good technology to pursue? Uh, <laughs> no, is my, my instinctual kind of response to that. It's kind of, uh, to me, it just really sounds like, uh, it sounds like, it sounds like a good idea, you know. Oh, we reduce uh, reduce our reliance on fossil fuels, and and yes, yeah. a lot of um, you know composite materials do come from fossil fuels. But the problem with fossil fuels isn't that they exist; it's that we burn them and then they make um, carbon dioxide and go into the atmosphere. You know, so it's kind of like you know, is that actually relevant? Um, also, people have this idea that wood is just inherently sustainable and good for the environment and a nice, happy, friendly um, material, and it can be, but it's not It's not guaranteed. And a lot of sustainable um, forestry practices are, are not that sustainable. You know, if you if you look into it and, you know, what the average person would consider sustainable, it maybe they meet the technical definition, but not quite the intent that most people would, you know, attribute to that word. Um, and then, of course, there's a, there's a limited mm -hmm. number of sustainable forests in the world plenty of things that we can do with wood, including just leaving the forest there as a carbon, um, you know, carbon gathering um, Sink, yeah. yeah, resource. So, yeah. you know, do you really, really get a benefit from using the wood in this way? Because, you know, it could be used in another way. Um, so my instinctive response is we don't really need to do this. It'll be very, it's interesting from, you know, an engineering point of view. Um, can we, can we make an 80 meter wind turbine blade out of wood? And, you know, we were discussing this before we started recording and it's like, yeah, maybe pr probably is my feeling, but geez, it's going to be heavy. 
And to me, it feels a bit like, have you ever seen um, people sometimes make um, bike frames, bicycle frames out of bamboo um, Mm -hmm. sections? And it's like, it's just, it's really, it's cool. You know, it's a bit of a gimmick and it's like, wow, you can do that. That's awesome. Um, It kind of feels like that. So, you know, one wind turbine with um, wooden, 80 meter long wooden blades. Yeah, like that's so cool. What a great engineering challenge or, you know, craftsmanship challenge um, there. But in terms of, you know, do I think this is going to roll out and, you know, save significant amounts of CO2? I don't know. Is it going to be cheaper than, um, you know, the winter blades we've already got? Uh, highly, highly, highly doubtful. I don't think you're going to see, um, you know, a blade, wooden blade made as quickly as a fiberglass blade. You know, normally winter blades are rolling out of the factory line one per day. Do <laughs> you really think you're going to be making a all wooden 80 meter long wood wind turbine blade in one day I, I don't think so and anything that massively pushes up the cost of wind energy is not good for you know co2 emissions overall so that's kind of the reason why i instinctively say like i would love no. to see one wooden wind turbine and not more than that <laughs> well how does flax fiber fit into this because we had talked to green boats and you know, they're making boats out of flax fiber and basically organic resin systems and those boats are f- fantastic. They are amazing. If you go on the Green Boats uh, LinkedIn page, you can see some of them. But that seems like it's a comparable technology to oh, yeah. fiberglass and a resin system. It's yeah. like in the same vein, right? So there is, there are renewable ways to do this. Is wood the right choice right now? Are there other renewable uh, CO2 eaters that we could use that could do the same job? When, when I think of sustainable logging or sustainable forestry, I'm, I'm in my mind, I start shifting gears from like two stroke chainsaws to like electric chainsaws and like the big skitter tractors and stuff that run on like, you know, they'll go through hundred gallons of diesel fuel a day. Like do that, do we switch them to electric? Does it work? Can that happen to make some, something more sustainable? So, I mean, Stora Enzo as a company that's, uh, you know, partnering with the, the blade technology companies also partnering with Mavion. And yeah. Mavion, we've talked about before on the show. Mavion is the company yes. that's making the towers. So uh, Stora Enzo, right? Maybe they've got someone really smart from like IKEA in the background helping them out, making making these things. That's what I was thinking about. <laughs> that's on the on the desk. You know, this could be the future. Um, but uh, so so I'd be a lot of Allen wrenches in their future. Yeah. So with with a, a you know, if this thing starts to become a more and more uh, mainstream. Uh, as is anything in wind or renewables or energy in general, you're going to start to see more of a microscope on them. So I would like to see what they believe by the the, the term sustainable. And it, so if you know ESG goals can surmount a bit of profit loss, as we've seen in the past, does it make sense from an ESG standpoint? Mm-hmm. Is it actually sustainable? If we can, I believe Rosemary geniuses like you in the engineering world could make this happen. You could make an 80 meter blade out of wood, uh, as we talked about. Is it the best use of wood? Is it actually sustainable? Is it going to lower the co- the levelized cost of energy? I- if it can't check those three boxes, I-, I don't see it becoming a thing. Get the latest on wind industry news, business and technology sent straight to you every week. Sign up for the Uptime Tech Newsletter at weatherguardwind.com slash news. It sounds like South Australia has had a little bit of uh, bad weather recently. They, they had a, a high-voltage transmission tower fall over, and that's not the first time that's happened. But uh, because South Australia has a lot of renewables, mostly rooftop solar, it seems like, uh, they've had to turn them off. Because they were transmitting that power to the rest of the country so that that one transmission line uh, was the feed for all that extra power. Now, they don't, now they're trying to handle too much power in South Australia. So while well, the uh, Electronet, which is the energy company down there, is trying to fix this huge pylon, they think it's going to take a couple of, of months, maybe longer, to get the, a replacement up. So they're, they're worried about what to do with all the solar energy that's hitting the grid. And they're, they're trying, how, trying to figure out how to, to manage it. So they're worried about... Um, having to shut off certain parts of the solar energy to, to keep from over, over energing, I guess, uh, the existing grid. Have you been following this, this, uh, sort of catastrophe and electricity grids and, and what are they trying to do to manage it? 
Yeah, so the uh, South Australia is a really interesting grid, and I talk about it a, a lot. I think um, it's I think the largest um, gigawatt scale grid that's predominantly based on variable renewables. So they don't have any coal um, power in South Australia anymore. They don't have hydro. They've just predominantly got um, wind and solar, and then they're um, using gas as well to you know balance everything out. But then the other way that they're balancing is that they're connected to the rest of the east coast of uh, Australia, the Australian grid, the, um, the, the NIM, um, the national electricity market. So that connects all of Australia except for not Western Australia and not the Northern Territory, but basically every, you know, most, most Australians are connected to this electricity grid. And so, um, yeah, South Australia has so much variable renewables that sometimes they've got a lot less than they need. And other times, and especially in spring, they have a lot more electricity than they need. And yet spring is the main time where they're exporting a lot, especially in the middle of the day. So South Australia, typically like last year and this year, um, nearly every day in spring, you see negative electricity prices in the middle of the day when everybody's um, you know, rooftop solar is uh, generating a lot. Um, and demand isn't that high. So they had a storm a little while ago. It took down um, the interconnector to the, the rest of the electricity market. And so now they're in their period of time where they would normally be exporting heaps of renewable energy to the East Coast, and they're not able to. So um, they've had some problems with blackouts, but um, yeah, another issue is that when they've got more energy, uh, more electricity than they need, they've got nowhere to put it. So. Um, yeah, it's just kind of it's a, <laughs> uh, it, it shows what happens when you know you rely on a something that a single point of failure can you know have a, a large consequence. And I know that they are in the process and were already in the process of building a second um, interconnection, uh, so that you know one tower falling down wouldn't have this uh, problem. But they're not there yet, and so yeah, it's it is a bit unfortunate to see all these you know green electrons. Uh, could have been available there, you know, they're not being able to be used at the moment. So it's a bit of a waste. Yeah, you have a complicated problem though, because you have so many energy sources. It'd be different if you had just power plants producing energy, you could sort of manage that. And it's only so many phone calls you would have to make. Oh, you but just turn in it a off, yeah. renewable energy grid like this, yeah, you just turn it off, right? In this case, you have a, a, a I'm assuming thousands and thousands of homes producing electricity that it would feed the grid. Are they able to manage all those variables simultaneously and kind of keep the grid stable? Um, yeah, yes. I mean, they they are able to to manage things to keep the grid stable, and they. Uh, I'm not sure if they do have all the powers that they want. They have been negotiating for a while, trying to get the capability to remotely turn off people's um, solar on their roofs. Okay. For this kind of situation, but also just for the, you know, like the, the regular run of the mill, you know, everybody, there's too many houses in this area have solar um, panels on their roofs now, and it's a really sunny day. There's no demand in the middle of the day. And so the, um, you know, the, the transmission grid just can't, can't handle all this, all these electrons that are trying to rush into the power lines at the same time. So that's yeah. kind of a more, you know, common occurrence, and this is a probably less less frequent but similar problem. Um, but uh, I mean, yeah. So solar rooftop solar, if you add it all up, I think it is the largest generator in the state. But it's um, it's not the only big generator. The, so I mean, obviously they can turn off the individual gas um, power plants and and do for the most part. Sure. They actually only need to leave two, they need to leave two on for reliability. Um, but other than that, they can you know have them all turned off. And then all of the commercial operators, you know, everyone that's exposed to the market price, obviously, if there's too too much in the system, then um, the price goes low and, and frequently goes negative in South Australia. And so anyone that's exposed to that is, wow. you know, automatically going <laughs> to turn it off if they can, you know, and a, a wind farm and a solar farm can easily just, um, yeah. just switch off and stop supplying. So I think they have got plenty of mechanisms um, and it's a bit easier when you've got this, you know, market based approach rather than a, you know, centralized control and command that might be a bit harder to send out the, you know, instruction to every individual generator separately saying, please. <laughs> it sounds like it's, it's like, it sounds like ready made decentralized <laughs> green hydrogen production. Like it could be there, right? Like, it, like if we get to hydrogen <laughs> vehicles, hydrogen electrolyzers yeah, at, every, at every, at every petrol hydrogen? station. Put them right in right into the grid. Yeah, <laughs> but 
Yeah, it's, um, so I, I would say that the, the fix for it is what the fix for it is is a more or a a more robust interconnected grid, possibly. Is that I mean? Yes, I think I think that, or it's more yeah. storage um, yeah. within South Australia, or it's curtailment. You know, people really yeah. hate curtailment. They hate for, yeah. for electricity to be generated and not used. But I mean, we see curtailment in all all parts of the electricity system, but also you know in other kinds of engineering. Like you don't build a dam so that it's yeah. always full. You know, you build it so that you know in the worst case scenario it will it will um, fill up, or you know, like rarely it will fill up. Um, and no one sees the, you know, the top bit of the dam that's empty and said, oh, no, it's been, you know, our dam is being curtailed. Um, and the same with, you know, transmission lines or a coal power plant is not sized to be used 100 percent all the time. It's sized so that when you need, you know, the, the largest amount, um, when you get your peak load that, you know, it can it can supply that. And the same with, you know, transmission, they're sized for that you know, once in a decade uh, extreme event when you, they just need more than ever, and no one ever complains about curtailment in any of those things. And so I think people are a bit funny with um, renewable energy because the you know the fuel is free. That people get really upset about wasting it, and um, it, it's just you know a matter of economics. It's really common in all kinds of engineering design, but for some reason people really stick on to not wanting to waste any um, generation from renewables more so than they're worried about wasting other assets that have you know been engineered. Well, it does raise the issue about the complexity of the grid. And I, when I watch YouTube, and I don't know what YouTube throws up to you guys when you're like thumbing through YouTube, the recommended videos. So I, I tend to get these really weird things like engineering with Rosie. And then I get videos about like the power system in Texas. So I get these hour long webinars about what's going on in, at ERCOT. And there was a really fascinating one. Now, now, maybe they know their audience, right? So I'm an electrical engineer, and they're throwing me electrical things. But they they threw up a video, which was the uh, solar farms in Texas have had two major shutdowns that are just triggered events. So they've had a, uh, a disconnect uh, and sort of a cascading disconnect of solar farms because of the way the, the electronics work and then – ERCOT as a power system, it doesn't have a way to like start it back up again. Like they, they go into protection mode, and some it sounds like in some cases. And it, it, when you, they started digging into why is this happening, they realized, of course, there's not just one cause. There's like 10 different reasons why this happens. And every different part of that grid reacts slightly differently. So it, uh, it, some of them saw the frequency change too low and they were, mi they were mismeasuring it. Some saw the voltage drop too low. So they shut off. Uh, it was a number of issues. And I just wonder as we get to the complexity, like a place like Texas, which is massive, right? You have this massive renewable grid. Does it become almost do you have to have a lot more oversight onto what is actually happening at the, even at the home level or at the farm level on how the energy is produced and how it's going to stay on, or does it need to go off? And how do you, how do you manage all that in a, in a state like Texas or in a, or in South Australia, which is another large area? I think that, I think part of it is buffer, right? Like Rosemary was saying storage within the grid, yeah. because we all talk about how, I mean, there's advantages to a decentralized grid. Okay, you have a couple big parts, but if you have little places all over the place, it, it safeguards it, right? You you eliminate those single points of failure. But if you can, and it, so then, but then also you make it so complex, and then you're talking smart grid and all these different things about can we control it back? And and you know, in in the U.S. as, as much as in, in Australia, homeowners aren't going to allow the the man to connect back to their stuff, and then that's not going to happen. Or they're going to fight it tooth and nail, you know what I mean? So especially in Texas, ERCOT, of course, freedom. Yeah. Um, so yeah, true. The, I think the answer yeah. is is creating buffers within the grid, and that is in the form of uh, multiple kinds of storage, battery storage or whatever technologies are, are becoming mainstream now, and CO2 and these other different things. Um, so I think you, you put that energy somewhere and then um, manage the load um, actively uh, through those sources. That's, that's my thought. In South Australia, it's largely about solar. You know, they they don't have you know a surplus, continuous surplus for days or, or weeks in a row. They have a surplus around midday, and then they have a deficit in the in the evening. It's the classic duck curve. So that's batteries, um, and uh, 
if you do put those in houses, you don't need the man to, you know, control that. You can have a system where it's up to that the householder. And there's this company in Australia called Red Earth that's doing that really well. They've kind of um, gamified it. They've got an app and it means that, you know, any individual house that's got, you know, solar and batteries and maybe an EV and some other loads, they can be their own, you know, micro energy trader. Um, and so, you know, like the, the app, it's B2X, got, yeah. you know, like a counter, how much money are you making okay. today? And, you know, you watch the spot price and the electricity market and you decide, oh, OK, I'm not going to use my clothes dryer now. I'm going to wait until, you know, later. Um, and OK, now is a good time that I should not be charging my electric car with my solar power. I should be exporting to the grid because, you know, I can make a lot of money from that. Um, so, you know, the power can can come down to the individuals. And I, I like the way that they're implementing it because, it um, you know, you can just you're making money off it and it's fun and people really get into it. And I expect that that's that's how it's going to, to go in the future. And, you know, you roll that out on a, a large scale, then you're going to see a lot less problems in, in the grid once you get the market set up right. But, um, yeah, that's definitely not just good to go. You know, it's not like every house could turn that capability on immediately. You need to figure out the, the settings and make sure that everything stays reliable. But um, I, I just don't see there's any way for us to not have a smart grid in the future. Um, you know, especially if EVs are going to be a thing, which they are, we have no choice to just let people do whatever they want, whenever they want with the, um, you know, the electricity grid anymore. You could not let everyone just come home from work at five o'clock and plug their car in and just have it start charging immediately. I mean, that would that would crash the grid. So we clearly are, we're going to have to solve this Inc problem and incentivize another way. Grid. Yeah. Yeah. Incentivize. Exactly. So like that, v, like there was a V2X yeah. pilot in Denmark when they were talking the exact, exact same thing we're talking here and what that company sounds like they're doing, but they were incentivizing people to uh, charge their cars in the middle of the night. Um, and, you know, and, and it was even to the point where there was charging stations. When you got to the office, you could plug in the office and you could do energy tr transfer there. So the V2X platform with the electric vehicles was not only in the home, but it was uh, throughout the community as well. Yeah, and um, Octopus Energy in the UK have something similar, like they have an EV tariff and it got cheaper at, you know, midnight or some specific time. But that in itself is not the solution because if you get enough people on that tariff, then all of a sudden you've got a spike in demand at that exact time. Midnight. So yeah. that's why, you know, this like yeah. um, spot right. price watching uh, uh, app or, you, you know, capability is better because then as a lot of people connect, then the price is going to go up. And so it looks less attractive to the next lot of people that want to connect. Um, so, yeah, I think... It, there's yep. a lot to figure out, a lot of details to figure out. Yeah, but Rosemary, if if I got to get up at one o'clock in the morning to go plug my EV in, at, at what point do you just say, you know, I'm just going to buy a damn horse? Yeah, that is not <laughs> smart. You know, because... That's not smart charging if you have to get up to do it. The smart charging the is that you've got an algorithm that is, you know, watching the price. Uh... You've told your car charger, okay, I need 80% charge by 6.30 in the morning. Um, yeah. Make it happen at the least, least possible cost. Um, you know, I'm not saying that. So it's like Star Trek. <laughs> it's it's the future. Make it so. It's the real future. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess I guess it's a future. Who knows if we're going to get there or not? It seems like it's very complicated. And the the more I hear engineers discuss the intricacies of, well, I'll give you the example. So so Apple makes a car, Tesla makes a car, Google makes a car. They all respond differently. You start plugging them all into the grid. You think the grid's going to be happy? Heck no, because they're all going to have these different performance standards. They're all going to be on. They're going to be off, right? I think that variability is treacherous. Yep. And without having some stability via battery or something else, I think you're going to now be in add trouble. Now the, uh, the heavy trucking idea in where they're talking about charging stations yeah. for semis and, and lorries taking as much energy as a small city in one spot. Boom, just to charge trucks. So start yeah. adding that in, then you really got some management problems. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated grid. I know everybody throws out the term, well, it's just going to be a smart grid, but what does that mean? Right? At some point, engineers like Rosemary are going to be there programming all this stuff <laughs> to make sure it happens. And then, but we're, there's, there's, there's like, there's, think about it. There'd be thousands of companies making devices that plug into this grid and, and add energy and take energy out. It gets super complicated. And I'm not sure we know 
what that future looks like and how stable it really will be. I hope it isn't engineers like me programming this stuff because I am an absolute hack when it comes to programming. <laughs> I'm basically, you know, I'm writing macros in Excel and uh, that's that's about all I do these days <laughs> with programming. Yeah. So luckily there are there are a couple of people programming these things and they, they exist already. And I think that the the thing to remember, Alan, is that it's an energy transition. It's not an energy step change. So it's not like we're gonna wake up tomorrow, everyone's gonna have an EV and a fully smart um, mm. home with a fully smart grid. It happens gradually. Companies like Red Earth already have their platform that's know. working for the small number of people that are on it. It will gradually grow. So, you know, it limits the size of the problem when things things go wrong all the time. And I mean, the Texas um, blackouts of you know, a couple of winters ago are an example of, you know, they, they've moved very fast and um, haven't figured out how to respond in every single situation yet. And so I think that's why it's important that it is, you know, right. a, a, a gradual transition. But I, I uh, you know, I feel very confident looking into my crystal ball that this is the way we're going because it, it aligns economically, you know, it, people will make money by doing it this way. So I, I'm sure that it's going to happen. And, um, you know, it's an opportunity for companies to make money, but also for individual households to make money. So I would expect somewhere like Texas and the US in general to be fast adopters of this because, you know, you guys, you guys love that taking the power. <laughs> power to the individual Cap and capitalism, making, baby. making money yeah so it, it should be yeah, right. should be the perfect place for it and yeah we, we do already see it starting to happen in australia and i would definitely have one of these uh, systems if i owned my own home then i would i would have solar panels and you know and a, and a battery and be trading trading energy and getting really excited about my results every day lightning is an act of god but lightning damage is not actually it's very predictable and very preventable Strike Tape is a lightning protection system upgrade for wind turbines made by WeatherGuard. It dramatically improves the effectiveness of the factory LPS so you can stop worrying about lightning damage. Visit weatherguardwind.com to learn more, read a case study, and schedule a call today. Well, Joel, I've just been watching this. Uh, well, we have Phil Totaro back from Intel Store, and we've been talking about insurance companies and their push to get their insured to use the OEM service agreements and the OEM companies to do maintenance on their wind turbines. And there seems to be a, a big push in that. Obviously, the OEMs want to do that because it's a nice little cash bonus into the revenue streams because the prices of turbines have been suppressed so much. But the independent service providers and the companies that are large enough, they can provide their own maintenance. Uh, they're not doing a bad job. I think it, it seems like we just have a dispute in the marketplace. Insurers are pushing one way, operators are saying another thing, and there seems to be a lot of uh, discussion around that point. So, Phil, can you just kind of give us the baseline of what's actually happening in the insurance market re regarding repair and repair companies? Sure. Thanks, Alan. So just to preface this, what we ended up doing was we've analyzed the um, Energy Information Administration's uh, plant level uh, net monthly and annual production data for uh, renewable energy assets. So they've published it for wind, solar, uh, thermal generation, etc. But specifically for wind, um, we took that data and we started looking plant by plant at um, how long before you saw like a 10% or more um, permanent degradation in AEPs. And what we wanted to do was to analyze that and see if there was a correlation between the type of maintenance um, regime that they were utilizing. So are they on a an OEM long-term service contract? Are they on a self-perform, you know, maintenance regime with an in-house, um, you know, capability like a Nextera and Invenergy, et cetera? Uh, or are they uh, utilizing an independent service provider? And what the data shows is that um, independent service providers actually have the, um, the worst performance or the least good performance, if we can maybe put a positive spin on it. Mm -hmm. um, but the reason is that most of the independent service providers are maintaining assets that are um, at least on average, I want to say it's like 15 to 16 years or older. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, the OEMs uh, have less frequency of uh, performance drop-offs on the assets that they're maintaining, but most of their assets 
where they have a long-term service contract are younger and you haven't really seen a performance degradation until you start reaching, you know, like eight, nine, ten years into the asset life. Um, the there's a dichotomy between the two, uh, th between two different types of asset owners who self-perform their maintenance. One are the larger integrated companies, like again NextEra, um, that actually have remarkably good performance on uh, and and very low. Um, a low percentage of degradation of their assets. Although mm. next era, to be fair as well, specifically, they tend to run their turbines into the ground for 10 years and then repower them to take advantage of the PTC um, extension. Um, but most of the larger um, asset owners are able to um, maintain their fleet very well. Um, it's some of the smaller and mid-sized um, asset owners who are self-performing that are actually the more challenged. Um, in, in being able to do this. And this kind of runs contrary, again, to the original premise here, which is the insurance companies all think that if you're an asset owner who's self-performing maintenance, you're probably not doing as good of a job as the OEM would. And that's not entirely, uh, entirely accurate. From Wind Power Lab, we preach to the insurance market and to operators all the time, be a prudent operator. If we're pointing towards the OEMs as uh, taking on these FSA, these full service agreements, do we run into any kind of, I mean, there's there's two parts to this question, I suppose. Do we run into any kind of nepotism with them hiding some issues or not dealing with some stuff? Or, or is it better because they may know what's happening to this certain kind of blade or these certain bearings across their entire fleet? Is Do we see any issues arising there as far as uh, trusting them to do the right things? Or or is it better for the for the a asset owner? Um, it's interesting that you that you say this because this is a, a topic that I, I work on a fair bit in Australia. Nearly all of the assets are done with um, OEM service agreements for the full lifetime. And um, the, the main type of work that I get is when there is a, a defect, usually a blade defect, and the asset owner is really unhappy with the communication that they're getting from the, you know, the OEM, who's also the service provider, you know that from the OEM's point of view, we've got the full service agreement, so you know it's on us if um, if we don't repair this properly. So just trust us. From the asset owner's point of view, they're like, you know, <laughs> we have a lot of money tied up in in this wind farm, and I want to be sure that the um, yeah that you know that you're doing doing the right thing with these blade repairs, and be sure that there aren't going to be more defects pop up. You know, if there's a serial defect issue and I'd never understand why it needs to work that way. Why, why can't we be a bit more, you know, upfront from the start? What do you think about that, Phil? To answer your first question, yes, there are certainly availability guarantees in in the service contracts. Um, the other thing that's also in there are uh, it's a clause for paying out liquidated damages. Uh, so if they aren't uh, maintaining the availability above a threshold and if the asset doesn't generate um, you know what it should in uh, taken over the course of like a full year um, and it's basically mutually agreed upon that it's down to the uh, you know the the substandard maintenance then the the OEM pays out a, a you know, a, a liquidated damages award to the, the asset owner as a result of uh, the lost production that they should have otherwise achieved um, had they maintained the, the availability of the asset. So they do have, the, an OEM does have a financial incentive from that perspective to, uh, to have adequate maintenance. I get the sense that the insurance companies feel that the claims which are filed are really just filed as a placeholder if they can get someone else to pay out on an issue that might otherwise be their responsibility. Um, and I think the insurance companies are starting to get wise to that and are starting to reject more claims. I mean, first of all, they, they can't, you know, they've had um, some assets that have had catastrophic failures throughout, you know, like there was a hurricane um, back in, I think, like 2017 or 18 in Puerto Rico. Um, where it wiped out an entire wind park and the insurance company lost like a hundred million dollars or something, wow. um, which was a problem. So, uh, you know, they're, they're taking, the insurance companies are taking a closer look at um, what they're insuring, how they're insuring it and the premiums that they're actually charging um, up front, particularly. 
Um, and why they're saying that they want OEM maintenance is because they, they again, they have this perception um, that the, the OEM knows the turbine the best and they would be the best positioned to take on the liability, um, particularly under like a full wrap contract. Um, it's basically, you know, we agree to provide maintenance and we agree to kind of uh, provide a warranty backstop to any of the um, major correctives that might be necessary during this, uh, the term of this long-term service agreement. So it's, mm -hmm. the insurance companies like it because it's taking some of the liability off their books and putting it onto the OEM. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're actually going to get better performance because again, going back to what Joel said, the consistency with which you actually service and maintain your asset adequately according to, you know, OEM specs or um, your own experience with your own assets, uh, if you have a big enough fleet, that's necessarily going to provide a better, uh, a better gauge. Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, it just seems like the insurance industry is still trying to adapt and even the operators are still trying to adapt to this moving marketplace. They're learning as they go and they haven't created products to, to fit in <laughs> where the operators and owners may, may need them yet. So there's a lot more mm -hmm. to come, it sounds like. Phil, hey, thanks, thanks for being on the program again. If if you want to learn about what we just talked about, <laughs> insurance and operators and ISPs and full service agreements, go to Phil's uh, LinkedIn page, Philip Tataro or Intel Store's LinkedIn page. And there's a plethora of information. You're going to learn a lot in a couple of minutes. And if you have any questions about the things you learned here today, reach out to Philip on his LinkedIn channel, on his LinkedIn page, sorry. All right, Philip, thank you. All right, thanks, everybody. Ping Monitor is a continuous blade monitoring system which allows wind farm operators to stay ahead of maintenance. Wind techs can often hear damaged blades from the ground, but they can't continuously monitor all the turbines. They also can't calculate how bad the damage is or how fast it's propagating based on sound, but Ping can. Ping's acoustic system is being used on over 600 turbines worldwide. It allows operators to discover damage before it gets expensive and prioritize maintenance needs across their fleet, and it pays for itself the first time it identifies serious damage or saves you from doing an unnecessary visual inspection. Stop flying blind out there. Get Ping's ears on your turbines. Learn more at pingmonitor.co. Well, Joel, I've just been watching this uh, high wind Tampin wind farm, which is supposed to be the largest floating wind farm in the world. It's off the coast of Norway. And it's if you remember, we talked about this a while ago, where the project is feeding oil and gas. Um, is it derricks out in the ocean Drill. out there or in the, production in the sea? Rigs. Yeah, production rigs. Drilling yeah. rigs, right? Yeah. So they're they're putting eleven wind turbines out there. They're eight megawatts each, so they're a total of eighty eight megawatts. Equinor's running it. They got their first wind turbine up and running, so they're producing power. And they think they're going to finish the project in twenty twenty three, which is great. You know, they're they're clicking right along. Now, the thing I noticed about this project is, and I wasn't fully familiar with it, was something called a joint mooring system. So they, there's eleven turbines, and they're kind of in two rows. But there's, they use a unique way of, join, of connecting them down to the ocean floor. And you want to just basically describe what that is? Yeah, I don't know exactly the, the layout of it. But a joint mooring system is, a, of course, a cost-saving mechanism, right? There's a, there's a lot of ways you can moor something offshore. If you're mooring FPSOs, fl floating platforms, the other things. Like, so you can do um, a suction anchor where you basically put a, put a, uh, a tube. Like, think about... Um, uh, like a paper towel tube, put it into the mud and then suck the water out of the top. It'll actually suck the paper towel tube right yeah. down into the mud, right? That's a suction anchor. Sure. And then you yeah. then you just tie the chain to the top of it, and that's a suction anchor now to the top side. You can do that. You can do it with big anchors. You can do a subsea micropiles where you drill drill into the bottom and then basically grout and then run cables up through that or chaining up through that. So there's a lot of ways you can yeah. moor, but when okay. you're mooring an individual system, say you had to put you, – you have to have at least, you know – three mooring locations you would think one single for one thing or right. three just to position it so if you had to have three anchors no matter which style of anchor you're putting in the ocean bottom for 11 turbines each you'd have to have 33 of them well it's a lot easier just to put a few on each end and then more them and then more the on the surface or on the subsurface on the floating surface more or uh, to tie them together so okay. so it's basically like um 
they're anchored to each other on the surface and then on either end and possibly in the middle, they have some individual mooring systems to the bottom. So it's just a, a way of cutting down on how many um, actual anchors they need to put into the ocean floor because they are expensive and time consuming to produce and install. And then it's an O&M issue. It's an okay. O&M issue. That's the big thing. Well, that's what I was wondering. All right, so in my head, what I'm thinking like, or something, I use an analogy. It's like when you watch a group of like preschoolers or kindergartners, and they're going to recess or going on a little field trip, and they're like chained to one another. And they, you get this the, long the connection is the of anchor. children. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But the teacher's the yeah. anchor, right? But if you watch that line behind them, it's kind of swaying all over the place because the kids, none of them can walk straight. So, and and they're five, right? And so they're all going their own different directions. Does that mean that the wind turbines are going to be kind of floating around? You, relative to one you're another? anchored on both ends and, and they have to be they can be yeah. dynamic but not that dynamic remember that they have to have ex okay. export cables coming from them that are connected to shore or connected to an oil platform right so you right. can't just That's let them flap in the wind okay. they're not going to be out there like a like a snake flowing around they will be fairly they'll be fairly <laughs> static but still dynamic they'll move a little bit but they're not gonna and then you'll have um i don't know if, you, if anybody can see this on youtube you'll have basically the umbilicals on a lot of these will come down into the water column and then have a loop in it that has f uh floats on it that's how they do it in oil and gas at least right when you have a uh, when you have a riser a gas okay. or oil export line or something coming up to the surface they do this and, and that is to build into it the ability to move and, and groove and shake a little bit um so that that loop okay. can basically take out any moving tension if need be. Okay, so it's a little service loop then. Yeah, 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 basically. So yeah, if there's movement in it, it, it doesn't. It's not causing stress too much stress on the the export cable and whatnot. Okay, so if you have two adjacent turbines, is there a cable, a really taut cable, running between them? So like, could you drive a boat between them without hitting this cable, or is it just something that just I'm just trying to figure out, like, does it really block off the area for, for ships and fishing? It would just block it off because you got these I cables would, and you can only use it in certain locations? I'm going to say no, not on the surface. I don't know the exact design, right? But I'm going to say no, not on the surface. They'll be okay. they'll be moored on the – or they're connected on the bottom of the floating concrete structure. So these are kind of designed like a spar. So down uh, on the okay. bottom, they'll be connected. Okay. In. So they yeah. – yeah, So okay. when they install them, they have a special okay. vehicle there called an, uh, an AHT, which is an anchor handling tug. And the tugboat will be there and has, it's just a, it's a big boat with a big work flat platform out the back. And then there's a couple of, uh, ROV work class ROVs that will do all the pinning and shackling of these things. So they have these special, special yeah. vessels out there. And we talk about this when we're coming to the U S there's not a, there's, there's no anchor handling tugs <laughs> available uh, off the East coast right nope. now or West coast, um, for mooring. Um, so these are specialized vessels that do this, uh, and, and, Will can can grab the anchors, move the anchors if need be, or zip pump the suction piles in. But then they have special ROVs that go connect them all. It's it's a it's it's not a trivial application subsea when they're installing these at all. So that so that's what we were going to cost, right? Mm -hmm. So it's O and M costs, operations and maintenance. Now right. you have all of these mooring lines and everything, and mooring chains, uh, export cables, in field cables um, to to inspect that are. Uh, it's a whole another challenge as opposed to just inspecting a monopile. Yeah. So if one of those cables were to break, that would be a really bad yeah, that would be day, cool. right? That would not be cool. Uh, <laughs> but, but luckily, okay. there's a lot of really <laughs> smart engineers in the world that have been doing those mooring chains for a long, long time. Um, there is some new technologies coming sure. out. Uh, subsea micropiles, one of them. I know a company out of Ireland that's doing this. Uh, some old colleagues, actually. That's really cool. They have a, a seafloor drill. So basically, like, the drill lands itself on the floor, and then there's a robotic drilling platform in, and they drill down to 80, 100 meters, uh, and then they grout it, and then they um, run the chain off the top. So they basically, like, they land this drill on the seafloor, drill holes, grout the whole thing in, and then connect the chains, and they leave, and there's no suction piles, no anchors, no nothing, and it's a gr concrete grouted in. It's it's really cool, and it's quick. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah, wild. Okay. Right. Well, Rosemary, if you're designing a wind turbine and it's floating like that, do you worry? Do you worry about that from like a blade design or a bearing design? And when it's sort of there's a little there's a little play in these things now. Do, is that a concern on the design side? Yeah, it's certainly not something that they just you know say, oh, she'll she'll be right. Um, let's just let's just assume that an onshore wind turbine will be will be fine with these new new loads on them. Um, 
And I think it's also really interesting the the, the operational you know aspects of it. And it's uh, it's actually a topic that I, I want to make a I want to make a YouTube video on floating offshore in general. And one of the interesting topics is, you, you know, so now a, a fixed bottom or an onshore wind turbine, you know, it's rigidly always, it's always going to be vertical, but floating, I mean, there's right. going to be some sort of swaying and then, you know, the aerodynamics are going to be really affected by that. So um, it's uh, on yeah. my list of things to find out is how they actually manage that, you know, are they monitoring the, um, the, the angle and compensating uh, and and how I'm, I'm not actually sure how they do it yet. So it's yeah. Sorry, it's a it's a question rather than an answer to your question. Yeah. Well, you're adding a couple more degrees yeah. of freedom, in well, there, right? The up, down, left, right. Yeah, yeah. 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 up, down. Yeah, yeah. and are they Six compensating degrees. with you know the tilt tilt angle of the the rotor? Or uh, I've never heard of a you know a turbine having that kind of control, but. Um, it would make sense that you would get better performance if you if you did, but yeah, I just don't know if um, that's too complicated compared to the improvement you can get, or uh, I don't even know how big are the angles you know that that we're seeing. But if it's more than a you know a couple of degrees, and it's going to give you a significant difference in um, in your output, but also the you know the loads, a normal wind turbine, all the you know the ones that people have been designing for decades. Their, even the structural design is based around, you know, the the wind basically hitting at the exact right direction. And if you all of a sudden you you know you got two three degrees out of plane, then you're going to get some weird aerodynamic effects happening, and including you know potentially stall, which is um you know really really difficult thing for a structure to to deal with. Um, also, you know, if you've got uh, waves come, you know, with a uh, periodic <laughs> frequency uh, are you going to start to see some you know kind of resonance somewhere it's um certainly complicated and i i know that there's a, a lot of knowledge that's come from offshore oil and gas um and into wind turbines so i, I don't <laughs> i think that yeah. the designers of these turbines know the answers to these questions that i i don't you think so i don't you know i wonder if this trial by equinor and remember, the Equinor is going to be involved in some of these California projects where it's going to be bidding on them. Like this mm -hmm. is a little bit of exposure about how you would build turbines off the coast of California that's going to, that are going to be floating. Do you have a small test field of 11 turbines like they have right now in this, in this mooring system? Are you trying out a lot of different control systems and just monitoring what happens? It gives you a little bit of time before you go do mm -hmm. it in California. Does that give Equinor a huge advantage? Because it seemed to me that it would. Yeah, and this isn't their first floating offshore wind farm. Um, right. So they they had the world's first, um, which has been operating since 2017 um, in Scotland. That was a bit of a smaller wind farm, but still five, six right. megawatt turbines. Um, so it's not exactly the same, but certainly, you know, they have – that they are doing a lot of development into floating offshore um, and they're, they're learning as they go. And so this one is, is bigger. It's um, what, like an 88 megawatt um, wind farm. And I'm sure right. they'll learn something from, from that. And, um, and, you know, from the longer operation of their first one uh, and go bigger and better next time. So I, I do think you're right that they're, you know, they're getting the early lead on some of these, um, these issues, but, they have started small. You don't see any, you know, gigawatt floating offshore wind farms being oh, put no. out there yet because yet. people don't know everything yet, and they know that they don't know. So it's yeah, right. You learn, but if you if take as much as you can if, from existing wind industry, as much as you can from existing oil and, and gas industry. Um, so you know, you you hope that you've thought of everything that that might happen, but you're aware that you, you know, you don't know yet what you don't know. And so you start small and, um, and pay attention, <laughs> pay attention to the problems you have so that you can fix them for the, the next big of the project. So when you, when California does this auction or when the, when the federal government does this auction off the coast of California, which is coming in pretty soon, it's like a couple of weeks away when this episode releases, mm -hmm. probably pretty close. Do you give bonus points to Equinor because they have a sense of, how big of an effort this is and they probably have figured out and, and eliminated some of these problem areas I think intrinsically it will come in their bid right there the bonus points will come at the the level of expertise and knowledge that is displayed in their presentation yeah yeah and also and because so we've seen a few projects in the u.s where you know developers are like oh actually this is going to be a lot more expensive than we thought so now um you know you need to pay us more so, you know, I would be, <laughs> if I was the state of California, I would be looking at, at exactly, that and yeah. be, you know, a little bit wary of um, somebody right. doing their first 
first project is this well, really going to happen like maybe they've estimated it will be cheaper than um you know a high wind uh uh, bid, but do I trust it? And do I trust that they're, you know, gonna gonna follow through if it does end up more expensive? So yeah, I think that it, they've definitely put the early runs on the board, and that will serve them well. I'll stand up for the wind turbine companies and the operators for a moment. What's happening in on the East Coast right now, particularly in my little state, is I think abhorrent on some level that the states, not only my state, but adjoining states are really sticking it to the operators and the developers of these projects. We're in a a unique economic time and the states are just looking the other way. Why would would we get involved in this? Yeah, there's inflation. Yes, there's high interest rates. Well, Well, how does that affect you? Well, it affects everybody the same, right? As the states grapple for more money and are trying to maintain their budgets and the whole thing, well, the state of Massachusetts is so overloaded with money, they're actually giving some of it back. Uh, when, when, you're, when your operators and, your, and the companies are telling you it's going to cost more money, you need to be listening to them instead of poo-pooing them. And I'm, I'm worried about that in, in California, too. Like, does, does what's happening in my little state affect the auction, what's going to happen on floating wind in California? Do, does everybody get a little bit gun shy about it and say, yeah, we would have bid $2 billion for this for this site. But you know what? No, not now. Not after we've seen on some other states. We're just not going to do that. And maybe we're, maybe they have people drop out, which is what the scary part is for, for us is that – Offshore wind, which has been promised and promised and promised and be the, the future, all of a sudden seems to be stalls it's in some down, places, yeah. and that's not healthy. Yeah. It, yeah, it's slowing down for sure. The, the one thing to, to for, for us and the listeners here as engineers um, and technology fans, this is a big win for the wind industry, I believe. That we've got, uh, we've yeah. got an 88 megawatt farm. I mean, yes. it's not it's not as big as the gigawatt, you know, Dogger Banks and stuff. But hey, we've got floating wind now right. at almost a hundred megawatt site. This is fantastic. So kudos to Equinor for making this happen Huge. and getting it off the ground. There's going to be, you know, this is yeah. the this is the baby step. You know, this is the 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 five or the seven turbines offshore in the U.S. that we have. That's great. This is really cool. This is the next step. This is floating. This is the biggest one in the in the world right it is. now. And there's more to come from this. So, so it's a victory for the industry, I believe. And that's a big engineering thumbs up for sure. It's it's amazing. It really is amazing. And you know, Rosemary's been talking about it for a couple of years here, and it's actually coming about. So, Rosemary's predictions are coming true, and it's it's finally good to see. I I just wish we could get over some of these hurdles faster. That's gonna do it for this week's Uptime Wind Energy podcast. Thanks for listening. Please take a moment and give us a five star rating on your podcast platform. Be sure to subscribe in the show notes below to Uptime Tech News, our weekly newsletter, as well as Rosemary's YouTube channel, Engineering with Rosie. And we'll see you here next week on the Uptime Wind Energy Podcast.